What the Dickens, 1812 to 1870 A.D. Charles John Huffam Dickens was born in Landport, Portsmouth, on the south coast of England on February 7, 1812. He was the second of eight children born to John and Elizabeth Dickens and described himself as a very small and not overly, over particularly taken care of boy. Although not wealthy, the Dickens family was not poor. They moved to Chatham-Kent in 1817 and sent Charles to the fee-paying William Giles School in the area. Despite his youth, he was a frequent visitor to the theater. He enjoyed Shakespeare and claimed to have learned many things from watching plays. By the time he was ten, the family had moved again, this time to London following the career of his father John, who was a clerk in the Naval Pay Office. John had a poor head for money but liked to impress people. As a result, he got into debt and was sent to Marshall Sea Prison in 1824. His wife and most of the children joined him there, a common occurrence in those days before the Bankruptcy Act of 1869 abolished debtors' prisons. Charles, however, was put to work at Warren's Blacking Factory, where he labeled jars of boot polish. Later in 1824, John's mother died and left enough money for her son to pay off his debts and get him released. John Dickens retired from the Navy Pay Office later that year and worked as a reporter for the Mirror of Parliament, where his brother-in-law was editor. He allowed Charles to leave Warren's blacking factory and go back to school. Charles's brief time at the factory continued to haunt him for the rest of his life. He later wrote, For many years, when I came near to Robert Warren's in the Strand, I crossed over to the opposite side of the way to avoid a certain smell of the cement they put upon the blacking corks, which reminded me of what I once was. My old way home by the borough made me cry after my oldest child could speak. Charles left school at 15 and worked as an office boy with a Mr. Malloy of Lincoln's Inn. Here he decided to be a journalist. He studied shorthand at night and went on to spend two years as a shorthand reporter at the Doctor's Commons Courts. Many thought that the institution of Doctors' Commons, a society of lawyers in London, was old-fashioned and ridiculous, including Dickens. His satirical description of his time there can be found in both sketches by Boz and in David Copperfield. Charles's first love was Maria Biednell, a banker's daughter whom he met in 1830. Their relationship came to an end after three years, probably through the wishes of Maria's parents who thought that Charles was not good enough for their daughter. Around this time, Charles started to achieve recognition for his own written work. He wrote for a number of newspapers, True Sun from 1830 to 32, Mirror of Parliament from 1832 to 34, and The Morning Chronicle from 1834 to 36. He was later to recognize how important these years were to him when he wrote, To the wholesome training of severe newspaper work when I was a very young man, I constantly refer to my first successes. December 1833 saw his first published, but unpaid for, work appear in the old monthly magazine, a story entitled A Dinner at Poplar Walk. On seeing his first work in print, Dickens wrote, On which occasion I walked down to Westminster Hall and turned into it for half an hour because my eyes were so dimmed with joy and pride that they could not bear the street and were not fit to be seen there. He wrote further stories for the Old Monthly, but when the magazine could not pay for them, Dickens began to write his series for the Chronicle at the request of the editor, George Hogarth. In 1835, Charles got engaged to George Hogarth's eldest daughter, Catherine. They married on April 2, 1836, and went on to have ten children, seven boys, and three girls. Biographers have long suspected that Dickens preferred Catherine's sister, Mary, who lived with the Dickens family and died in his arms in 1837 at the age of 17. Dickens had asked to be buried next to her, but when her brother died in 1841, Dickens' place was taken. He wrote to his great friend and biographer, John Forster, It is a great trial for me to give up Mary's grave. The desire to be buried next to her is as strong upon me now as it was five years ago, and I know that it will never diminish. I cannot bear the thought of being excluded from her dust. Not only did Dickens wear her ring for the rest of his life, he also wrote the epitaph which appears on her gravestone. Young, beautiful, and good, God numbered her among his angels at the early age of 17. In 1844, another of Catherine's sisters, Georgina, moved into the Dickens household. Some say that the novelist fell in love with her too. 
The first series of sketches by Boz was published in 1836. Boz was an early pen name used by Dickens. It came from the nickname of a pet child, a younger brother, whom I had dubbed Moses in honor of the Vicar of Wakefield, which, being pronounced Bozus, got shortened into Boz or Bose. Shortly afterwards, with the success of Pickwick Papers in 1837, Dickens was at last a full-time novelist. He produced works at an incredible rate and, at the start of his writing career, also continued his work as a journalist and editor. He began his next book, Oliver Twist, in 1837 and continued it in monthly parts until April 1839. Dickens visited Canada and the United States in 1842, taking Catherine and her maid with him. During that visit, he talked on the need for international copyright because some American publishers were printing his books without his permission and without any payment. He also talked about the need to end slavery. His visit and his opinions were recorded and published in American Notes in October of that year, causing quite a stir. December 17, 1843, saw the publication of A Christmas Carol. It was the first of Dickens' enormously successful series of Christmas books which ran until 1848. It was so popular that it sold 5,000 copies by Christmas Eve and has never been out of print since. Dickens became something of an international celebrity. In 1853, he toured Italy with his friends Augustus Egg, the artist, and Wil Wilkie Collins, the author and playwright. On his return to England, he gave the first of many public readings from his own works. At first he did these for charity, but before long he demanded payment. From childhood, Dickens had loved the stage and enjoyed the attention and applause he received. He performed in amateur theater throughout the 1840s and 50s and formed his own amateur theatrical company in 1845, which occupied much of his time. By 1856, Dickens had made enough money to purchase a fine country house, Gads Hill in Kent. He had admired this place ever since his arrival to the area as a child, and it must have felt a huge achievement to finally own it. However, Gads Hill was not a happy family home. A year later, Charles met a young actress called Ellen Lawless Turnin, who went on to join his theater company, and they began a relationship that was to last until his death. Charles separated from his wife Catherine in 1858. The event was talked about in the newspapers, and Dickens publicly denied rumors of an affair. He was morally trapped. He was deeply in love with Ellen, but his writing career was based on promoting family values and being a good person. He felt that if he admitted his relationship with Ellen, it would put an end to his writing career. Catherine moved to a house in London with their eldest son, Charles, and Dickens remained at Gads Hill with the rest of the children and Catherine's sister, Georgina. There were rumors of Charles and Georgina having a relationship, too. On her deathbed in 1879, Catherine gave her collection of Dickens's letters to her daughter, Kate, instructing her to... Give these to the British Museum, that the world may know he loved me once. The more he tried to hide his personal life, the more it came out in his writing. One of his most popular books, Great Expectations, in 1860, has the elements of imprisonment, love that can never be, people living in isolation, and the urge to better oneself, all subjects that were part of Dickens's own life at the time. He looked, at, he looked after Ellen until his death renting houses for her to live in and making regular secret journeys to see her. Not easy for the local celebrity that Dickens had become. He went to incredible lengths to keep his secrets safe, including renting houses under different names and setting up offices for his business in places that made it easy for him to visit her. On September 4, 1860, he wrote to William Henry Wills, the sub-editor of Household Words, Yesterday I burnt in the field at Gads Hill the accumulated letters and papers of twenty years. They set up a smoke like the genie when he got out of the casket on the seashore. And as it was an exquisite day when I began, and rained very heavily when I finished, I suspect my correspondence of having overcast the face of the heavens. In 1865, Dickens was involved in the Staplehurst rail crash, an incident which disturbed him greatly. He was traveling by train along with Ellen and her mother. They were most likely returning from a secret holiday in France. The train left the track, resulting in the deaths of ten people, with a further forty being injured. It is reported that Dickens tended to some of the wounded. He wrote to his old friend Thomas Mitten about the crash. My dear Mitten, I should have written to you yesterday or the day before, if I had been quite up to writing. 
I'm a little shaken, not by the beating and dragging of the carriage in which I was, but by the hard work afterwards in getting out the dying and dead, which was most horrible. Two ladies were my fellow passengers, an old one and a young one. I don't want to be examined at the inquests, and I don't want to write about it. It could do no good either way, and I could only seem to speak for myself about myself, which, of course, I would rather not do. Even when writing to a friend, Dickens still hid Ellen's name, and he didn't want to be a part of the inquest in case his relationship became public knowledge. By 1867, Dickens' health was getting worse. His doctor advised him to rest, but he carried on with his busy schedule, including another tour of America. Mark Twain saw him during this second American tour in January 1868 and wrote, Promptly at 8 p.m., unannounced and without waiting for another stamping or clapping of hands to call him out, a tall, spry, if I may say it, thin-legged old gentleman, gotten up regardless of expense, especially as to shirt front and diamonds, with a bright red flower in his buttonhole, gray beard and mustache, bald head and with side hair brushed fiercely and tem tempestuously forward, as if its owner were sweeping down before a gale of wind. The very Dickens came. He did not emerge upon the stage. That is rather too deliberate a word. He strode. By the end of this tour, it is said that Dickens was so ill that he could hardly eat solid food, surviving on champagne and eggs beaten in sherry. He returned to England and, despite his bad health, continued his public reading appearances. In April 1869, he collapsed during a reading in the north of England, and he was again advised to rest. Dickens didn't listen and continued to give performances in London, as well as starting work on a new novel, The Mystery of Ed Edwin Drood. This novel was never finished. Dickens had a stroke and died suddenly at Gads Hill on June 9, 1870. He had asked to be buried in an inexpensive, unostentatious, and strictly private manner. But public opinion, led by the Times newspaper, insisted that he should be buried in keeping with his, great, his status as a great writer. He was buried at Westminster Abbey on June 14, 1870. His funeral was a private affair attended by just 12 mourners. After the service, his grave was left open and thousands of people from all walks of life came to pay their respects and throw flowers onto the coffin. Today, a small stone with a simple inscription marks his grave. Charles Dickens, born 7th February 1812, died 9th June 1870. Dickens was so closely associated with Christmas that, shortly after his death, the critic and poet Theodore Watts Dunton overheard a London barrel girl say, Dickens dead? Then will Father Christmas die too?